All right, we're back in the Fitz News studio for another edition of the Week in Review. We've got a big episode this week, folks. Our director of special projects, Dylan Nolan, is going to be on the set giving us his blow-by-blow account of the first week of the federal trial of Russell Lafitte, the first criminal trial tied to the Murdoch murders crime and corruption saga. And yes, the Murdoch name was evoked extensively in this criminal proceeding, folks. We're going to hear about the first week directly from Dylan. We're going to get his thoughts and observations on that. In addition to that, we're going to talk some Murdoch Murders civil case action, particularly a lawsuit involving Alec Murdoch and his former law firm. We're going to dig into that a little bit, some shadiness and some backdoor deals possibly going down in connection with that case. Last but not least, we're going to hit politics. We're going to recap how my predictions fared in the midterm elections, which were held this past Tuesday. Did I get the races right? Do I know what the heck I'm talking about? We're going to find out that in our last segment. All that and more coming your way on the Week in Review. All right, so our first segment this week, how could it be on anything else? Murdoch murders, crime and corruption saga, the first criminal trial tied to this still unfolding story in Charleston, South Carolina. It's the federal case against Russell Lafitte, the disgraced banker, former banker rather, who has been accused of being a key cog in the web of criminality spun by accused killer Alec Murdoch. Now, this trial began with the defense dominating the narrative. And before we dive into this with Dylan Nolan, our director of special projects who was down there, I wanted to point out what I think is a pretty interesting parallel, if you will. You'll recall in the weeks leading up to some of the recent hearings on the double homicide case tied to this saga, defense attorneys Dick Harpootlin and Jim Griffin were driving the narrative in the press. In fact, they had everyone chasing the story that there may have been another killer, not Alec Murdoch. However, when The courtroom gaveled into session, and again, that hasn't gone to trial yet, just a preliminary hearing, but at the last preliminary hearing tied to that case, very quickly, uh, the defense narrative started to evaporate. Uh, Prosecutors laid out a a tight timeline for that double homicide, which has, again, put additional strain on Alec Murdoch's already eviscerated alibi. So defense attorneys driving the narrative out of court, once court is gaveled into session, you see prosecutors swiftly retake the narrative. That happened in a big way in this case, folks. Leading up to this trial, defense attorneys Bart Daniel and Matt Austin driving the narrative in this case, pointing to a broader conspiracy uh, revolving around Russell Lafitte and folks at Palmetto State Bank and potentially Alec Murdoch's former law firm PMPED there in Hampton, South Carolina. But again, once court gaveled to session, Defense took a back seat, folks. Prosecutors have been driving this train. Dylan Nolan, you've been down there all week. You've been watching uh, hours of testimony, incredibly detailed uh, financial documents, emails. How has the defense's pretrial spin held up so far? It started melting pretty fast day one, um, and and days two and three has only degraded further. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about that melting? How did it start? How has it progressed? How has it unfolded? I think it started as soon as the prosecutors were able to get some of the documents, including checks uh, and emails in front of the jury. And it started to melt the defense, the defense case, because it demonstrates one, what Russell Lafitte knew, two, when he knew it. And they've been able to demonstrate that nobody other than Russell Lafitte could have transacted the money that he transacted, and they've been able to demonstrate that there's no legitimate purpose for any of these transactions. And he stands, he's facing six uh, various financial crime charges, and they've been able to, using the extensive documentation that of course exists in the banking system, show step by step how the money flowed, and there's really no good explanation that the defense has been able to provide as to why the money has flowed that way. And in fact, the highly anticipated cross-examinations of some of these witnesses have have failed to really erode their credibility or that prosecutorial narrative, have they? Well, and I think a lot of that is the fact that this is Russell Lafitte's trial. And the prosecution and the judge are making sure that this trial is about Russell Lafitte. I know that you wanted to talk about how many times I've been typing Alex Murdaugh into our shared notes this week because his name comes up more than anybody else. But ultimately, it's Russell Lafitte's trial. Regardless of whether Alex Murdaugh was guilty, and from what we've seen in these documents, he certainly has a lot of financial crime problems himself. 
it has done little to prove that Russell Lafitte is not guilty of the crimes that he stands accused of. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, that broader conspiracy we kept hearing about pre-trial just hasn't materialized. I wouldn't say it hasn't materialized in that I don't, I can't conclusively say what people did or didn't know. I can say that it has not been demonstrated in the testimony that we've heard. Fair enough. We're going to get into a lot of this testimony, particularly some checks we want to talk about. Certainly. We're going to talk about some of the, as you you termed it, doors that have been closed right. to the defense. Uh, but before that, let's talk a little bit about Alec Murdoch, because certainly you're absolutely right. The prosecutors have been driving uh, all of this case to Russell Lafitte, the former banker. Uh, but Alec Murdoch's been a huge part of the proceedings. And in fact, in the opening statement, uh, lead prosecutor Emily Limehouse dropped a bombshell. Tell us a little bit about about that detonation. It's a very interesting detonation because while the prosecutors have been working actively to exclude uh, or, to, or to stop the defense attorneys when they try to veer off into a completely unrelated Murdoch territory, completely unrelated to the charges their client faces, Murdoch territory, she did drop the bomb uh, telling us a little bit more about day of the double murder, telling us that Alec learned that his law firm was aware of discrepancies between what they should have in their accounts and what they do have in their accounts. So that gave us a big insight into potential motive for the double homicide. And I don't know what her reason was for putting that information out there because it, it does little to, you know, further her, her case against Mr. Lafitte, but that wasn't dropped by accident. Right. And what was interesting, the opening argument she drops the bomb. Right. Next day, the witness who made that inquiry of Alec Murdoch, the PMPD, former, uh, I guess she's now the chief financial officer at the new... The Parker Law Group. Parker Law Group. They Ms. Jeannie Seconder, who happens to be Russell Lafitte's sister-in-law. And by the way, in the first two days of the trial, every single witness who was called to the stand was in some way related to Russell Lafitte. If that tells you... I mean, this this is... Par for the course with this story. If it was any other story, I would think this is ridiculous. And some of the reporters who were there, who I don't think have been as glued to the Murdaugh beat, were like, what the hell is happening here? But par for the course. Well, you're a Massachusetts boy, man. You don't understand that's how we do things here in South Carolina. Everybody's related, man. Oh, man, don't throw me under the bus <laughs> like that. Don't throw me under the bus like that. Well, as you looked at that testimony, though, again, obviously connected to, to Russell Lafitte in those familial ways, but... As far as the facts they laid down related to his culpability here, you described it to me as, as damning evidence. Yeah, and we mentioned the familial ties. Um, Norris Lafitte, who is a family member of Russell Lafitte and who serves on the bank's board, he was, when the prosecutors, of course, they, if you're unfamiliar with how a criminal trial works, evidence has to be introduced. The lawyers can't just go up there and read the evidence themselves. They have to get a witness to present the evidence. And this is something that if you've never watched criminal proceeding, you might not know. So the examination of these witnesses will start, usually the direct examination will start with the lawyers using the witness to get whatever evidence into the bloodstream that they need to get uh, admitted into court. So that's usually a little bit more boring because they're going through documents, they're going through emails, especially in a white-collar case like this. I, obviously, the double homicide trial is going to play completely differently than this, but they go through all the documents, and of course, things progressively look worse and worse for Mr. Lafitte, and they get to the end, and I don't remember the exact question, but Prosecutor Limehouse asks something about his, his belief about Russell's culpability, and he tears up. I mean, he's an older gentleman. He tears up. He's chokes up. It's very hard for him to talk about it, but, you know, he indicates that he believes that Russell's responsible for the crimes that he stands accused of. And this is definitely an extremely emotional trial for everybody involved because everybody who's taken the stand at one point in time trusted Russell Lafitte, at one point in time loved Russell Lafitte. And I know that Jeannie Seconder said that she still has those feelings for him, and I, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, all of the uh, all the people that the government has called to the stand have presented facts and and said that their understanding of those facts is is not good for Russell. And and not only that, not only the testimony, but from what you've shared and you've been tweeting this entire trial. By the way, D Nolan two thousand on Twitter. If you're not following Dylan. 
we'll put this up on the screen right now at D Nolan 2000. Follow him today, uh, and you'll not only get a great recap of what's been happening this past week, but also be on the lookout for future updates. But as we talk about, it's not just the testimony, is it? It's the it's the evidence you talked about that that, that was introduced through these witnesses, right? Right. And um, Ronnie Crosby, who who testified on the last day of the trial this week, Thursday, uh, PMPED, now Parker Law Group partner, who worked with Alec on multiple of the cases where the clients were, after the case was completed, defrauded, testified to his discovery of uh, the evidence that we've you know since seen presented in court. And he testified to how he decided to call all, all these people and a few other people, the people that we've heard present members of Russell's family, his loved ones, and he basically had to break the news to them that he had discovered these documents and that they only they only painted a picture that could uh, be explained one one way, and that's that Russell was lying to them, misleading them. And now it should be noted, all of these individuals who have testified, it is very much so in their personal interest to make it seem as though they were shocked. Because if it could be construed in any way that they knew they could be facing uh, criminal charges as well. Sure. So we cannot take them at their word, but also these are all uh, very smart individuals. You don't become a, a bank executive, a bank board member, a law firm partner. You don't become a CPA and a CFO unless you have something going on above your shoulders. So these people aren't going to incriminate themselves, but they're also not going to put themselves in a position to lie on a witness stand. Do I believe what they said in the chair is true? Yes. Do I necessarily believe that it's the whole story with all of these witnesses? No. And you can count on us to continue uh, in, in the coming months to dig into these people, to dig into the stories that they presented today, to get these transcripts once they become available and go through every single word that was said and see if that lines up with the information that we know. But regardless of their personal involvement, it does not look good for Russell. Right. Even if they're only telling half of the story, that half of the story is so compelling that even if the other half implicates them, that's not going to get Russell the feet off the hook, is it? No. I mean, this would be, I think I made this analogy when we were talking about the case earlier this week. It's like if uh, you're at a trial for a bank robber and your defense attorney came up and said, well, that's the getaway driver. He, he's not guilty. Well, you, you still went into the bank and pointed the gun at the teller. Maybe they should be charged as well, but that's not saying that you didn't rob the bank. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how I've perceived it. I know talking to other members of the media, that that's how they've perceived it. And obviously we can only wait to see how, how the jury interprets this, but... Well, we've heard a few of the jurors had nodded off during the proceedings. We received reports of that from multiple folks who were inside the thing. But as a, as an accounting grad, guy with an accounting degree, this was something you were very interested in following, not just from the the, uh, the criminal side of it, but just from the business side. Yeah, and uh, first of all, Judge Gurgle, if you're watching, I'm I have no comment about any of the jurors. <laughs> I've not looked at a juror, nothing. We heard this right. from other people. This Correct. is not coming from us. Correct. We don't want to be within six feet of a juror. Correct. But from accounting perspective, it's very interesting. And one thing that I'll note, uh, something that you you see when you're thinking about designing business processes to be resistant to fraud, which is something that every company worth its salt does. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to design a process that one person cannot break. It's very easy to design a process that will basically re requires two people to turn the key. You know, you think about launching an, a nuclear missile, one person cannot do it on their own. It's easy to design business processes that one person can't break. But from what I heard in my education, it is very difficult to design a process that two people with power cannot break. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of what we've seen here. I mean, you saw Jeannie Seconder's testimony, and I uh, apologize if I'm mispronouncing her last name. I might have that a little off, but they trusted Alex. And accounting and trust are not two words that go together. And I, that's a part of why I didn't want to get into that profession. You are professionally 
being an a-hole to the people you work with. If you are an accountant working at a company, you have to be a jerk to everybody. And the fact that she was going on that witness stand and saying that she trusted people as a, a CPA reflects very poorly on her professionally. Mm-hmm. Very poorly on her professionally. Uh, the, the accounting practices at PMPED were not at all acceptable. Uh, and that is something that has been made abundantly clear and I think is something that will have real ramifications in the civil world going forward because all of these potential plaintiffs are going to be able to point to what the former CFO of the law firm said in federal court as they uh, consider taking action against the partners. That's a very good point. That could really impact claims. I mean, she she just testified to the firm's negligence mm-hmm. in uh, in preventing their, their clients from being defrauded. Well, and as we look at that, there's obviously cases that PMPED has filed against Murdoch. Um, the firm obviously did a lot of damage control. Talk about, they, they spoke on the stand, both Seconder and Crosby talked about the atmosphere at PMPED and the aftermath of what of not only the discovery of, of Alec Murdoch's alleged financial misdeeds, but the double homicide, the roadside shooting. We heard a lot of testimony about that, didn't we? Right. And I'd like to back this up for our viewers. We've had Jan Malinowski. We've had Norris Lafitte. Those are both uh, board members coming from the Palmetto State Bank side. And we've had two witnesses coming from PMPED. And both organizations, as they've told their stories on the stand this week, went into absolute damage control mode when they learned that Alex Murdaugh was defrauding his clients. Now, there have been a lot of questions asked by lawyers on both sides. When did the bank learn this? When did the firm learn this? There is no the bank. There is no the firm. A bank is a, you know, the, the executive board of the bank is a collection of individuals. I think that a majority of the people at the law firm and a majority of the people at the bank had no clue what the hell was going on until it was exposed to everybody in 2021. Mm-hmm. Not so sure that there aren't a couple other individuals who were in on it there. Uh, and I don't want to name any names here because I, <laughs> I like not being sued, but we're going to keep digging into that. Well, let me ask it to you another way. Based on what you've heard this week, what you've read about this story, what you've reported, what you've investigated, all of it, is there a chance Russell Lafitte and Alec Murdoch really did act alone? That they're the only two involved in this massive scheme to defraud, or defraud and rip people off? It's certainly possible. Um, there are things that I think that people should have seen, and you know they can. I think that there's definitely a case to be made. The case that Gene Seconder was making from the the stand that. Things got by her, mm-hmm. that they made honest mistakes. But I think that there's also fact patterns that I've seen that, like, for example, um, once all of this came to light, there was a, a vote held in the board at Palmetto State Bank. And the board of Palmetto State Bank, they're all Lafitte's. Mm-hmm. But uh, Russell Lafitte's father voted n- not to remove him from his role of CEO, and Russell Lafitte's sister abstained. And the information that they knew at that time was certainly enough to fire him. Certainly enough to fire him. And there's information dating back that Russell Lafitte's father, when the board initially started questioning Norris Lafitte, the first uh, the first witness who was on the bank's board, started questioning loans to Alex Murdaugh, Charles put his foot down and said, if he asks for more money, we're going to loan him more money. So he... Charles was actively shutting down this uh, this line of inquiry into Alex. Now, I don't know. Is he doing this because he's a, uh, a longstanding member of that community who believed in the Murdaugh good name? I guess that's what prosecutors believe because we haven't seen charges filed. But I've certainly seen a lot of things that don't look good for Russell's sister, Gray, Gray and or, or for his father. Mm-hmm that they should have taken action when they were presented with clear evidence, basically. Right. And we were joking that we heard the uh, the reverse beep, beep, beep. The bus <laughs> was damn near backing up over those two this week. Uh, the defense the defense almost ran them over. I wouldn't say they quite threw them under the bus, but I was sitting on the edge of my seat there for a second, waiting to see where the defense was going when they started asking questions about those two. 
I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's talk about where the defense is going because obviously you've talked and, – and bef- actually before we get into that, let's talk about some of these doors that have shut. Two key doors that we talked about earlier, Dylan, uh, the timing. All right. But then also there's a case here where, guess what, Russell's been implicated – in a case that does not involve Alec Murdoch. Tell us tell us about these two dynamics. Right. Um, Malik William, that's a uh, personal injury case, I believe. Might have been a defective vehicle case, but it was settled for $100,000. It, it didn't go to trial. And importantly, PMPED partner Paul Dietrich dealt with that case. Alex had no... Uh, it, he was not involved in any capacity as an attorney in that case. He only got involved after Russell Lafitte was named either a conservator or a PR, I can't remember which in this case, to to steal the money. But there there has been this line, you know, repeated over and over again by the defense trying to insinuate that Russell was relying on Alex as an attorney. And we heard this a lot uh, before the trial. We heard this a lot from defense-aligned sources. We heard this uh, insinuated a couple times in the courtroom, but I think that that line of defense has been effectively shut down both by this case where Alex was not involved as an attorney and also Ronnie Crosby testified to when the law firm's legal relationship, when they finished providing legal counsel to these people, which if you don't know, you file a lawsuit, you work with a law firm, eventually it will settle and whoever's paying you the money, be it an insurance company, be it the party that you've sued personally, they pay you this money, you sign a release form basically saying, we're not going to sue you again. At that point in time, the, the money's paid to you by the law firm. They are no longer representing you. You're just b- back to not being a client of the law firm. That's how your relationship with the law firm ends. And I don't know about in every case that alleged fraud occurred, but certainly in many of them, the date that the legal relationship between PMPED, so Alex Murdoch representing them on their behalf, and any of these clients, it, it happened well before. That means that Russell can't say, oh, I was relying on Alex as my attorney. No, he and Alex were just private individuals colluding to do what they allegedly did. Mm-hmm. So those are two key points there. Obviously, the the defense is going to have to find a way out of that box. Right. Let's talk now about where does the defense go from here. We've heard this week rumors about potential testimony from Alec Murdoch. However, there were two conditions that were laid down by his counselor, Jim Griffin. Limited use immunity, meaning that anything he says can't be used against him. Uh, And then in lieu of that, limiting his testimony to very specific points of fact. And the word we've gotten from all corners is that the prosecution fairly, rightfully, is not going to agree to that because they don't have any sort of deal with Alec Murdoch. They're not going to give away potential cases they could make against him in the future. So it doesn't look like there's any way Alec Murdoch's going to be put on the stand in this case. Is that your sense of it as well? Or? Yeah. And I mean, you know, you've been communicating more directly with Murdoch's representation because I've been tied down in federal court this week, but it certainly seems that way. And I know that this was viewed as kind of a Hail Mary, but I don't, even if Alec sits on the stand and says, I did it all, Russell didn't do any of it. I mean, okay, he's been discredited so thoroughly this week that I can't imagine that any juror would look at him as anything other than uh, a piece of trash not to be trusted. Mm-hmm. And not only that, the, as you've mentioned, the the evidence that's been admitted through these witnesses. Right, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that that would be an effective line of defense, even if they were able to get him into court, which it sounds like they're not going to be able to. Let's talk next about these tapes we've heard so much about. We're told up to four hours of audio recordings made by Russell Lafitte. This was a huge topic of discussion in the weeks leading up to the trial. Uh, First of all, learning that these tapes even existed, but then second of all, trying to assess what they could mean in terms of this trial. Obviously, an agreement was reached before the trial regarding the admissibility of some of this material. We still don't know exactly what is coming in, but we will hear or at the very least read from some of these tapes. But let me ask you this, Dylan, again, based on what you've seen in the first week of this trial, whether through testimony or evidence uh, that's been entered, what could possibly be on these tapes to exonerate Russell Lafitte, yes, let's, perhaps he's going to implicate other people, but 
Can you imagine anything that's on these tapes that could possibly get him off the hook? No. Um, now, I, I do want to say, all the witnesses we've heard from have been the government's witnesses to this point. I think that there will be witnesses that come and testify to Russell's character. It seems like this, from from everything that I've heard, from all of these people who loved and trust Russell, trusted Russell, it seems like he genuinely was a good guy. I think that Alex seems like he was putting up a ridiculous front, like a, like peel off the mask style front. I mean, you, you've seen what Alex has looked like in court. A man looks like a shark. His eyes are dead. Russell, to me, appears to be a, a lot more normal of a person. You know, I, I, I think he got mixed up and did bad things. I think he stole from people that it's absolutely deplorable to have stolen from. And I think that there will be witnesses that talk talk about who he is and the parts of his personality that are good. But at the end of the day, he's charged with committing financial crimes. And there have been documents presented that indicate that he has committed financial crimes. So mm -hmm. that only goes so far. Right. I mean, I, how does any of that have relevance to the facts of the case? So he's a nice guy. Okay. I mean, you <laughs> know, who knows, who knows how a juror interprets that? True. That's why you True. take these things to trial. Right, Dylan. I mean, that's why... I, you take these things to trial. So obviously the defense is going to have their day or days. They're going to have their say. They're going to have an opportunity to try and refute this. I guess the question now, is there anything they can do other than roping other people potentially into this? Is there anything they can do to exonerate their client? Well, the important thing to remember is that every witness we've heard to heard from to this point has been the government's witness. So the defense hasn't had the chance to put their people on the stand. That means that they have not been able to have direct examination, which is a way for them to introduce evidence that's favorable to their client. So when they're able to put their people on the stand, when they're able to go direct, and when they're able to get the evidence in front of the jury that they think might reflect well on their client, things might change next week. Like, like we just said, that's why you take things to a jury trial. So we're going to have to wait and see. Uh, I think that this could be a bad week for some of the other individuals and entities that we've heard about this week, whether that be board members at the Palmetto State Bank, whether that be partners and employees at the law firm, whether it's those two institutions themselves. The question is, if you implicate those individuals and institutions in other crimes, does that do anything to prove that Russell Lafitte did not commit the crimes that he stands alleged to have committed? Now, as a member of the media... I would love it. Expose as much information as you can. and I'm happy to live tweet it and report it. You're happy to write articles about it. And we're happy to have plenty of discussions like this because for a year we've been gridlocked. For more than a year we've been gridlocked on all of these people. We, we of course, have been researching them. We know what they, who they are, what they do. But this is the first time we've had them under the penalty of perjury. So... Any information that's revealed next week is going to be huge for us, you know, for people who are invested in this Murdoch case. But what will it mean for Mr. Lafitte's defense? Only time will tell. Right. But an uphill climb for him. And again, you mentioned earlier talking about those other potential culpable parties. Got to mention this. The prosecution has been very adept at bringing Alec Murdoch into this and using Alec Murdoch for its purposes. But the defense it seems every time they try to bring Murdoch into it, they get slapped down by the judge. That's an interesting dynamic to watch as this unfolds, not only as we hear from victims, but again, how does that Murdoch dynamic continue to play out? Uh, is the prosecution able to continue leveraging him uh, while the defense is unable to? Yeah. You know, I, I've been thinking multiple times watching this trial, sitting there in the federal courthouse, on Broad Street. Are there two teams of prosecutors here? You know, it feels like there's a team of prosecutors prosecuting Mr. Lafitte, and it feels like there's a team of prosecutors prosecuting everybody else in the town of Hampton other than Mr. Lafitte, but it doesn't necessarily feel at all times like there is somebody defending Mr. Lafitte. Right. And as this thing continues to un unfold, it's going to be incredibly interesting to watch how does that dynamic play out, because we have seen at times, hostility between state and federal prosecutors in this case as it first launched, as the initial charges were being investigated and uh, uh, indictments contemplated. There was hostility between those federal and state prosecutors. Very clear now that 
those issues have been put to bed. It seems everyone's singing off the same sheet of music. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think in law enforcement situations where there's questions over who has the the ability to prosecute what, there's always going to be that conflict. But at the end of the day, I think there there might be an enemy of my enemy is my friend situation going on here. Well, Dylan Nolan, thank you again. An incredible week down in Charleston. We'll be back down there again this coming week. Right. Where again, we're going to hear from victims and possibly get into the the defense's counter narrative to everything that's been dropped. But amazing work this week, Dylan. Yeah, and I know you got some more Murdoch news that we're going to pivot to. I'm going to hop back behind the cameras where I belong and uh, and let you get to that, and then maybe we'll do a little bit of political. I mean, I know we just had some pretty shocking midterm elections, although not shocking uh, in the state of South Carolina, and I'm sure that you're going to want to talk about that. Absolutely, but I appreciate you being on this side of the camera and the work that you've done down in Charleston this week. Thanks again, man. It's been fun. Awesome. All right, so as Dylan mentioned, one more bit of Murdoch-related news to cover this week. That relates to a civil case that was filed last October by Murdoch's former law firm against him. Now, again, this is relevant particularly as it relates to the fact that two employees of that firm testified against Russell Lafitte in the federal trial this week. But PMPED, the former Murdoch law firm, filed this suit against Alec Murdoch back in October of 2021, alleging a scheme to steal money from the firm. And obviously, we have seen some merit to those allegations. But here's the problem. This case was decided without a trial, or without even court hearings related to it. It was decided in a summary judgment, which means that a judge looked at the filings from these two cases, from these two sides, and issued the decision based exclusively on that. Now, in this case, that's understandable because Alec Murdoch pled the fifth. So basically, you've got allegations that he lied, cheated, and stole, and then Murdoch is saying nothing in response other than invoking his right not to incriminate himself. So certainly understand a summary judgment being issued in that case. But here's where it gets a little bit shady. The judge in this case, Bentley Price, well known to our audience for some questionable decisions regarding a violent offender down there in Charleston recently, some very questionable sentencing regarding a very violent individual who was accused of multiple, multiple instances of attacks against women. Judge Price let this guy go without any jail time against the advice of victims and prosecutors. We did a huge series on that, and we did an even bigger story in its aftermath when state lawmakers came to Price's defense. We found out well, guess what? They were doing that because they were getting some favorable uh, decisions from Judge Price as well, at least one of them in that case. But Judge Price has issued a decision in this case, which again, not controversial in and of itself, but he scheduled motions to be heard for damages. And he scheduled those to happen basically one week after his ruling. And then he only gave Murdoch's counsel five days to respond to that. Now, I've talked to several lawyers they say this is unheard of in terms of the expediency uh, of this damages hearing. But here's the thing. There wasn't a hearing. Price solicited these motions, these submissions for damages, without scheduling a public hearing. In other words, he was going to decide how much money PMPD was entitled to from Alec Murdoch without any public discussion. Now, the receivers in this case were not happy about that. An attorney for those receivers, Amy Hill, a lawyer here in Columbia, South Carolina, according to the emails that this news outlet obtained, raised a stink about it. And Judge Price did reconsider that ruling and, and has agreed to have a hearing in public on those assets. But again, this raised a lot of questions, folks, because one of the problems in South Carolina is that you've got this backdoor backroom, good old boy deal making where connected defendants and connected attorneys are able to get their way with these judges. And this shouldn't have happened behind closed doors, folks. And it shouldn't happen in this expedited manner. That's why we need transparency in this judicial system of ours. That's why receivers were appointed. Uh, and thankfully, they spoke up in this case. Because again, if, if a judgment is issued in this case, and Alec Murdoch's law firm is able to jump to the front of the line ahead of perhaps more deserving victims of Alec Murdoch's alleged financial fraud, that's unfair, folks. That's unfair. And again, good for the receivers for doing their job and sticking up, again, for what we believe are the real victims of Alec Murdoch's alleged financial fleecing. So we'll continue to keep track on that development and, again, all the civil, all the criminal cases related to the Murdoch murders crime and corruption saga.
All right, so we're going to recap the 2022 midterm elections, and I want to point back to last week. I offered some predictions here in South Carolina on how the midterms were going to go. I predicted a Republican romp. I said McMaster, Henry McMaster, the incumbent governor, would win his race by 11 percentage points over Democrat Joe Cunningham. I predicted a 53 to 42 percent win for McMaster. Down in the first congressional district, a race that a lot of folks thought would be competitive, I predicted Nancy Mace would romp by a 54 to 44 percent margin. I also predicted in the South Carolina upstate, uh, embattled Congressman William Timmons, who was unopposed but had a write-in candidate running against him in the aftermath of his uh, self-inflicted sex scandal. I predicted that that write-in candidate would get 3.6% of the vote. Now, how did I do? Again, I'm supposed to be able to do this for a living. I'm a former political consultant, political prognosticator, and let's look at the numbers, all right? Let's look at the numbers here. Not bad. Henry McMaster actually got 58% of the vote, so 5% more than I thought. Uh, Joe Cunningham only getting 40% of the vote, a huge romp for McMaster. And then down there in the 1st Congressional District, Mace with over 56% of the vote against Democrat Annie Andrews. Again, a stomping, a stomping. Republicans all across the state cleaned up, folks. Uh, by the way, Timmons right in opponent, over 9%. That was the only thing I really missed, folks. That's a huge, huge number for a right in candidate. Again, you don't Hardly ever see writing candidates get more than 1% or 2% of the vote, but in William Timmons' race, 9%. That spells real trouble uh, for William Timmons in the event he decides to run again for another term in 2024. I don't think he will, but looking at the state legislature, again, Republicans dominate this chamber. They've, they've had a majority ever since 1994. They have consistently added to that majority, but guess what, folks? After this election, Republicans have a supermajority. 88 out of 124 seats, folks, that's nearly 71% of the South Carolina House of Representatives is now in Republican control, again, for whatever that's been worth. Here in South Carolina, we've consistently seen bad outcomes economically, academically, with respect to quality of life, infrastructure, the justice system, clearly. Obviously, Republicans are going to need to come up with some sort of answer at some point, or maybe not. If they keep drawing districts with their Democratic allies in such a way that leads to uh, non-competitive elections. And by the way, here's a number I really want to point out to you. Very important number here. Listen to me, folks. 59.7%. Those were the percentage of House districts in which candidates ran unopposed. Unopposed. So in six out of 10 races for the South Carolina House of Representatives on Tuesday, there was no race because there was no opposition to these incumbent candidates or nominees. Is that a good thing for democracy? I don't think so. Bottom line, we did not have competitive elections in South Carolina this year at all, at all. And when you don't have competitive elections, folks, you don't have accountability. You don't have accountability. And when you don't have accountability, guess what you end up with? Corruption, overspending, again, bad outcomes across the board. So we're going to continue to push for more competitive districts, more competitive races, and holding those candidates and elected officials accountable. All right, so one other thing to point out regarding the midterm elections, I want to look nationally very quickly because, again, South Carolina, first in the South presidential state, we have a huge bearing on the national political scene. So I want to point out some dynamics that were at play earlier this week in the national elections. Again, a huge Republican red wave in South Carolina, bigger than the one two years ago, stormed uh, across the statewide offices, delivered a supermajority in the South Carolina State House. But nationally, that red wave, folks, it just didn't happen. It didn't happen. Republicans were projected to storm to a huge majority in the U.S. House. They're going to end up with a very slight majority. They were expected to possibly retake the U.S. Senate. Does not look like that's going to happen, although there are a few races in Arizona and Nevada that are too close to call in the Georgia U.S. Senate race just across the river. That'll be going to a runoff. But a lot of fingers being pointed in the aftermath of this underwhelming GOP performance. A lot of fingers being pointed, particularly at former U.S. President Donald Trump. A lot of his candidates did not perform as well as expected. And a lot of folks in the Republican Party are looking for a new leader now. Who might that be? Well, for that, we're going to look down in Florida, where the uh, governor of that state, Ron DeSantis, who 
basically carried the state by less than a percentage point back in 2018, won it by 20 percentage points, this time over former Governor Charlie Crist, a a former Republican turned Democrat. But just a tremendous victory for Ron DeSantis, who is, by the way, now, some would argue, the Republican frontrunner for president in 2024. DeSantis and Trump will be coming to South Carolina quite a bit over the next two years as they gear up for that race. So count on Fitz News to not only keep you up to speed on what the Republican Party does in South Carolina with its huge majorities, but also what happens as those national Republicans start coming to the Palmetto State to court, those important early votes. Keep it tuned to Fitz News for all that political news. And thanks again for supporting our election coverage. All right, that's a wrap for this week's edition. Once again, tremendous thanks to Dylan Nolan, our director of special projects, who went down there to Charleston, South Carolina, followed the Russell Lafitte trial minute by minute, all three days. Dylan will be back down in Charleston again this coming week, and I also look forward to having him back in the studio for next week's edition of the Weekend Review. Again, we could have talked about this case for another hour. We probably will get to talk about it for another hour in the next episode. So if you're a Murdoch murders crime and corruption junkie, Keep it tuned to Fitz News, not only during the week as we cover this trial and related matters, but also keep it tuned to the Week in Review where we recap them and dig deeper into all of the details from these cases. Thanks again for watching. Keep it tuned to Fitz News. Appreciate your support.